Differentiation Techniques, Part 1. I was recently asked by my school district's advanced placement department to prepare a presentation to students at our district's AP Calculus prep session next month. My assigned topic is differentiation techniques, and those techniques are specifically the power rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule, implicit differentiation, trigonometric differentiation, differentiation of logarithmic functions, and exponential differentiation. But for working problems, whether in your class, your AP exam next May, or a problem you encounter later on in your working career, what counts just as much as the technique is the recognition to use the technique. So an important question is, what is differentiation? What is meant by differentiate? We'll first speak to synonyms of differentiate. One synonym is find the derivative or take the derivative. Another is find dy dx if the equation starts with y equals. Another would be find y prime if the function to be differentiated is in y equals form. Another would be to find f prime of x if the function is in f of x or function notation. Also the function could be g prime of x if in g of x notation and so on. And then to differentiate twice, there's find the second derivative, find y double prime or find f double prime of x. Now conceptual question, what are you finding when you differentiate? You are finding the equation or function for the slope of the original function given input values for that function. And now we'll go into the context of why we would need to differentiate. If we need to find the tangent line or slope of a line tangent to a function at a point, or to find a normal line to a function at a point, a normal line is perpendicular to a tangent line, to find velocity given a position function or acceleration given a velocity function, or to find an instantaneous rate of change at a point or time or an input value or to find a local maximum or minimum of a function, or to find a point of inflection or where a function is concave up or concave down. There are some others as well, but these reasons I just gave cover a great deal of the opportunities for applications. Or yet to find intervals over which a function is increasing or decreasing. And of all the techniques, the first one mentioned, the power rule, is the one thing that is the bedrock or foundation technique for most of the other methods and will take you a long ways in your differentiation and calculus career. In the materials for the session, I was given 24 multiple choice problems. In this presentation, part one, we'll get to six of them. The other 18 problems should be covered in videos parts two, three, and four. Here's our first problem. If f of x equals x to the three halves power, find f prime of 4. This problem is an AP Calculus multiple choice problem format with answers A through E. What we'll do with this problem as well as many of our other problems is use the power rule and this is the power rule. If we have the function of a variable to a power of that variable as in this generic rule example the function f of x equals x to the power of n. Applying the power rule f prime of x, or in other words the derivative of that function, equals n times x to the power of n minus 1. The accurate use of this simple rule will take you a long way in calculus. And using the power rule in our problem, we have f prime of x equals 3 halves times x to the power of 3 halves minus 1. And cleaning up the exponent, 3 halves minus 1 is one half. So we have f prime of x equals three halves x to the one half power. The x to the one half power is the exponent written in rational form. In the more popularly recognizable radical form we have f prime of x equals three halves times the square root of x. Now we're ready to evaluate this derived function for x equals 4. So we have f prime of 4 equals 3 halves times the square root of 4. And the square root of 4 is 2. So we have f prime of 4 equals 3 halves times 2. The 2 over 2 cancel on the right side to equal 1. So we're left with f prime of 4 equals 3. And we box in our answer as correct and circle answer choice C as well. Problem 2. If x cubed plus 3xy plus 2y cubed equals 17, then in terms of x and y, dy dx equals? And we have these five multiple choice options, a through e. 
With how these y's and x's are mixed together, it will not be easy or perhaps even possible to solve for y first, then find the derivative of the other side of the equation. Plus, with the way the problem is presented along with the answer choices mixing up x's and y's, those are signs that we should differentiate implicitly. And here we bring over our equation so we can work below. Differentiate in place x cubed using the power rule we have 3x squared. Next to differentiate 3xy we use the product rule in conjunction with the power rule we have plus 3x times the derivative of y or dy dx plus y times the derivative of 3x which equals 3y and that's using the product rule which requires again the use of the power rule plus the derivative of 2y cubed which is 6y squared dy dx which is again using the power rule and on the right side we have the derivative of 17 which is 0 and that's using the power rule also because that 17 is 17x to the power of 0 Next, I notice a common factor of 3 for all terms on the left, so we'll divide the whole equation by 3. So this leaves us with x squared plus x dy dx plus y plus 2y squared dy dx equals 0. Now we'll start separating the terms with the dy dx's by subtracting x squared and y from both sides of the equation, which we can do by moving the terms to the other side of the equation and that gives us x dy dx plus 2y squared dy dx equals negative x squared minus y. And factoring out dy dx on the left side of the equation we have dy dx times quantity x plus 2y squared equals negative x squared minus y. Now we solve for dy dx by dividing both sides of the equation by x plus 2y squared. We cancel x plus 2y squared over x plus 2y squared on the left side of the equation to equal 1. So we bring down what's left and that's dy dx equals negative x squared minus y over x plus 2y squared. And lastly we can factor out the negatives from both the x squared and the y in the numerator and get negative x squared plus y over x plus 2y squared. And that's our multiple choice answer A, which we circle as correct. Here we use the power rule in conjunction with the product rule to arrive at our correct answer. Problem 3. An equation of the line tangent to the graph of y equals 2x plus 3 over 3x minus 2 at the point 1 comma 5 is... And here are the answer choices A through E, each an equation in the standard form of the line. Since 2x plus 3 over 3x minus 2 is a function divided by another function, we can use the quotient rule. And this is the quotient rule. If you have a function, let's call it y equals high over low, we can derive this function using the quotient rule and it's y prime equals low d high minus high d low over low squared. There's a quotient rule song for this one. Low d low d low d high minus high d high d low all over low squared. All we need to do now is identify the component parts. First, low is 3x minus 2, high is 2x plus 3, d low is 3, and d high is 2. So using the quotient rule in this instance we have low d high which is quantity 3x minus 2 times 2 minus high d low which is quantity 2x plus 3 times 3 over quantity 3x minus 2 squared. At this point we could do a bunch of simplification but since we have our input value of 1 we'll just find y prime of 1 by substitution and we get y prime of 1 equals quantity 3 minus 2 times 2 minus quantity 2 plus 3 times 3 over 1. And this simplifies to y prime of 1 equals 1 times 2 minus 5 times 3 over 1 so y prime of 1 simplifies further to 2 minus 15 which equals negative 13. And now having a point and a slope we have y minus 5 which is y minus y1 and that equals negative 13 times quantity x minus 1 and that 1 is x1. And using the distributive property on the right side we have y minus 5 equals negative 13x plus 13 and adding 5 and 13x to both sides of the equation we have y plus 13x equals 13 plus 5 which can be written in standard form as 13x plus y equals 18. 
And this is our answer choice B, which we circle as correct. That was an application of the quotient rule to differentiate and with the given point, find the equation of a tangent line at that point. Problem four, if y equals tangent of x minus cotangent of x, then dy dx equals, and we're given our five multiple choice options. This problem can be very easy if we remember our trigonometry differentiations and think a little bit. This is one of those things that you just have to remember. Little memory aids can help from time to time, and here's one that I've heard used by another calculus teacher, Tracy. We had a teacher I used to work with, Miss Tan. Miss Tan is very attractive. In fact, many might call her sexy. And in order to find, to fit our calculus needs today, some might even call her sexy sexy. And here's the rule. We can remember that Miss Tan is sexy sexy and write down tan x secant x secant x. What you do now is apply the memory aid. To apply the memory aid is cover up what you're differentiating. Here we're differentiating tangent x, so we cover up tan x, which I've done here with my thumb. After covering tan x, what do we have left? Well, we have secant x secant x, or secant squared x. And for cotangent, we have a similar relation, and it's cotangent x equals cosecant x cosecant x with a negative sign out front. And for the derivative of cotangent x, we again cover what is being differentiated. In this case, we cover cotangent x. And negative cosecant times cosecant, or cosecant squared x, remains. So we have secant squared x and negative cosecant squared x remaining. And this is where we see the proper differentiations, answer choice D. So we circle our correct answer D. If all else fails, you could derive both tangent and cotangent x using sine x and cosine. But for me, it's easier to remember that Miss Tan is sexy sexy. Problem five, if f of x equals quantity x minus one squared sine x, then f prime of zero equals. And we have our answer choices A through E. We should see that we have the product of two functions, f of x equals quantity x minus one squared and f of x equals sine x. So we'll use the product rule, and this is the product rule. The derivative of the product of two functions, u and v, is u times v prime plus v times u prime. So using the product rule, u and v are quantity x minus one squared and sine x, respectively. And u prime, following the power rule and chain rule, will be two times quantity x minus one to the first power times the derivative of quantity x minus one, which is one, which simplifies to two times quantity x minus one, which further simplifies to 2x minus 2. And v prime is cosine x. Now putting it all together, we have f prime of x equals quantity x minus 1 squared times cosine x plus sine x times quantity 2x minus 2. Now to evaluate f prime of 0, we have f prime of 0 equals quantity 0 minus 1 squared plus sine of 0 times quantity 2 times 0 minus 2. Since we're looking at evaluating trigonometric ratios, we'll take a quick look at the unit circle. At an angle measure of zero, we have a cosine value of one and a sine value of zero. So we cross out the sine of zero since the sine of zero is zero. We're left with f prime of zero equals negative one squared times one. So f prime of zero equals one. So we box in our correct answer and circle answer D. Problem six, for what value of x does the function f of x equals quantity x minus two times quantity x minus three squared have a local maximum? And we have our answer choices A through E. Since we have a local maximum somewhere in the answer choices, this is one that could be solved without calculus by substituting and evaluating. But the calculus concept that gives the answer to this problem is that the function can have a local minimum or maximum where the first derivative of the function equals zero. And what we're looking for here is the place where the slope of the function changes from positive to negative. Just like we did in our last problem, we'll use the product rule to differentiate. This one is done in the uv prime plus vu prime manner as done in problem five. That gives us quantity x minus two times two times quantity x minus three to the first power times one plus quantity x minus three squared times one. And simplifying, we get two times quantity x minus two times quantity x minus three plus quantity x minus three squared. On either side of the plus sign, we have a common factor of quantity x minus three. So we rewrite as f prime of x equals 
quantity x minus 3 times 2 times quantity x minus 2 plus quantity x minus 3. And simplifying on the right side, we get f prime of x equals quantity x minus 3 times quantity 2x minus 4 plus x minus 3. So this reduces to f prime of x equals quantity x minus 3 times quantity 3x minus 7. Next, we use the zero factor property to find the zeros of the function. So we have x minus 3 equals 0 and 3x minus 7 equals 0. And solving for x, we get x minus 3 and x equals 7 thirds. And now looking at the answer choices, there is only one of the two zeros that appears, and it's x equals 7 thirds, so that has to be our correct answer. The test writer gave us a break here because if 3 were one of the answer choices, we would have needed to do more analysis. If you run into a problem like this on your AP test this coming May, you'll move on after this point and use that time to work on other problems you can get right and augment your score. But I'll do a little max-min analysis to better figure out what's really going on with increasing and decreasing maximum minimum. I've collapsed the work done upward and drawn a number line with 7 thirds and 3 are critical numbers included. We're going to evaluate the value of f prime of x at places to the left and right and, and in between these two critical numbers. To evaluate a value to the left of 7 thirds we can find f prime of 0, 0 is less than 7 thirds. We don't need to find the value of that function, but only whether that value is negative or positive. At x equals 0, we have a negative times a negative, which equals a positive. So we place a plus sign to the left of 7 thirds above the number line and draw an arrow, an up arrow below to indicate a function increasing in value. Next, we'll try out a number between our critical numbers of 7 thirds and 3. And for that number, we'll use 2.5 or 5 halves. And for this input, we get a negative number times a positive number, which equals a negative number. So we place a negative sign above the number line and a down arrow below the number line to indicate a decreasing value. Now for the right of 3, we'll use a value of 4. And for this, we get a positive times a positive, which of course is positive. So we place a plus sign above the number line and an, arrow, an up arrow below to indicate an increasing function. So this diagramming verifies that we have indeed a local maximum at x equals 7 thirds. After we were able to correctly choose answer D, we didn't need to do all this, yet this is an analysis tool that can help us out on other problems where more analysis is crucial. Just reviewing the eight different differentiation techniques, I will point out that we used in these six problems, six of these eight techniques, mostly in combinations of these techniques. In parts 2 through 4, we'll definitely have the opportunity to get to logarithmic and exponential applications as well. This has been Differentiation Techniques Part 1. Thanks for viewing.